Hey, amen, hey, amen. Hey, Good morning. Welcome to Road to Damascus Church. As the video said in the beginning, welcome home because you are indeed home amongst the members of Road to Damascus Church. Uh, we are so glad that you are here today. We thank our praise team uh, for being always being so obedient and giving us timely uh, word through song. Uh, what we should be uh, remembering, what should be in our hearts as we continue to move forward and go down this road of change to become what God has called us to do. Uh, 2021, we're in 2021, uh, well into 2021. And this is my weekly reminder for those of you who have the means, those of you who are able, those of you who have prayed about it and prayerfully consider uh, for 2021, we're asking that all members uh, donate an additional 21 above and beyond uh, their tithes and offerings uh, so that we can bless uh, other organizations and other ministries. Again, this is if you have the means, if you've prayed about it and God has put it on your heart uh, to sow that additional $21 above and beyond, uh, make sure you make the notation that if you do participate, uh, I, I make two separate donations, but if you do it on one, just indicate that $21 is going towards uh, above and beyond, just so we know. Uh, with that, we are into, it's well into the scholarship season. We're getting close to the deadline of which all the scholarships must be uh, filled out, applications must be in. Uh, they can go to the website, our church website, www.r2dchurch.org, and there is a, a link uh, or a tab they can press for scholarships. Uh, it has the scholarship application that they can download in PDF form and fill it out. It has all the information that they need uh, to fill us uh, of what they need to submit a fully completed application, including uh, transcripts, letters of recommendation, because without them, we can't consider their, their application. This is important for us because this, this year we're giving away $15,000 worth of scholarships, including one scholarship that will be valued at $4,000, payable at $1,000 per year, as long as the student is making academic satisfactory uh, progress. These are for graduating high school seniors going to a, a four-year college or university. Additionally, we're awarding uh, six, 10, I'm sorry, 10, was it six? Well, we're awarding $500 stipends for existing college students uh, to, to uh, receive uh, for uh, books, fees, food, uh, whatever it is that they need. Uh, those are for existing college students. Uh, the uh, high school graduate, uh, the high school scholarship is for graduating seniors who live in the Los Angeles area. The stipends are for any college student uh, that lives in LA but goes to school anywhere they choose. If you have a, a student that goes to Morehouse or Spelman but their parents live here in LA, they're eligible for that $500 stipend. We wanna bless our Los Angeles, our local uh, children uh, in this area who are going on to pursue higher education. Again, $15,000 total is what we're awarding uh, this year, which is well above the 5,000 we awarded last year. So we are on the move. Uh, this is how we're using uh, your gifts that you bless this ministry with, uh, with your tithes and offerings. And with that, uh, we, the way that you can be a part of this ministry is to uh, partner with us is you can, we have four different ways in which you can donate, uh, one through PayPal, uh, info at r2dchurch.org. That's info at r2dchurch.org. You can use Givelify at Road to Damascus or Cash App at the dollar sign R2D Church. That's the dollar sign R2D Church. And always remember, the two is the number two, not T-O, it is the number two. Or you can mail a hard copy check to our post office box. Post office box 1382 Norwalk, California, 90651. Uh, so prayerfully consider uh, partnering with us, prayerfully consider sowing a seed into the ministry, prayerfully consider uh, being a part of Road to Damascus. Everything you do, do with prayer. Don't do it because other people are pressuring you. Don't do it because I'm asking you to do it. Do it because the Holy Spirit has led you to do it. We always want to take everything to God in prayer. And that's all I have for right now. I will see you shortly after the end of the next video. Everybody be blessed.
The Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, and the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its stories are true, and its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here, paradise is restored, heaven opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, our good, the design, and the glory of God, its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, and guide the feet. Read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, health to the soul, and a river of pleasure. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all who trifle with its sacred contents. Pray it in, read it through, live it out, and pass it on. Amen, amen. Good morning, Road to Damascus Church. It is so good for you to be here, to be in the house of God with you this morning. Uh, I, I was going to do, we'll say this to the end, but I'm feeling that I need to say it now. We, we, we had a death uh, that occurred yesterday of, of uh, those of us who, who attended, used to attend the Brookings AME Church. And um, we had a good friend of ours pass away yesterday, a Mr. Willie Nelson, uh, age of 76. It, I'm not certain of all the details, but I know he was in the hospital uh, this week for surgery. And unfortunately, the Lord called him home. Fortunately for him, unfortunately for those who were left behind who love him. Willie was married to Lorraine. Uh, Lorraine, I met Lorraine at Brookings and it turned out she and I worked together at Toyota for a number of years and didn't even know it until we made the connection and, and stayed there. We, we both, uh, Lorraine and I were in a ministry at Brookings that was led by um, uh, the first lady, Charles Edda Nixon. Uh, gap ministry, we called it God Answers Prayer. She was part of that prayer ministry. Willie was very active at Brookings as an usher, sang in the male choir. I sang with him in the male choir. He wasn't a very good singer, but he was always willing to sing for the Lord. And he leaves behind uh, several children uh, and, and grandchildren. One of his children, uh, Courtney Nelson, as the one who designed our first Road to Damascus t-shirt on the day that we opened our service to the public. Uh, Courtney had designed those t-shirts for us and Willie now has gone home with the Lord. And we, we want to remember uh, Willie's family, uh, his wife Lorraine, all his, his children and his grandchildren, uh, that his family will uh, be able to endure this time, that this the new normal for their lives will be uh, something that they can adjust to. We know the pain won't go away and we know the loneliness won't go away, but we do ask for God's comfort uh, with them. And so let's, let's pray. Father God, we just thank you and praise you this morning. Uh, we lift up the family of Willie Nelson this morning, God, uh, that his family be comforted in this time, that they remember all the good times. They remember him as the man who provided for his family, who loved and protected them fiercely, who was there for them and gave them the life that they desire. God, we remember them, remember his life as we remember 
remember his service as a, an usher at the Brookings Community AME Church. We remember him as the, the person who couldn't sing, but still sang anyway at the top of his voice to your glory and praise as you have said to make a joyful noise. And while it was a noise to us, it was a sweet sound to your ear. We remember his laughter. Willie was such a, a, a an honest soul. He, he, he just, it was no filter. He may have been rough around the age, edges about, for some, but he was well, exactly what you wanted him to be. Because even with his roughness, he believed in you. Even in, in the times that people would be turned off by his attitude, he was honest. He, he had an honest heart, a man who walked in integrity, God. And so we just ask that he be with you, that we stand in the gap right now for him, God. That he, he believed in you. He accepted you as your Lord and, as your as his Lord and Savior. And we pray that he is with you in comfort right now, not experiencing any pain, any issues with his body, because he is in a restored body right now. And so so we ask that you be with his family, comfort his wife and his sons and daughters and his grandchildren, that they always will have the good and fond memories of the man who raised and loved them, the man who protected and provided for them, the man who led them to church, not sent them to church, but led them to church and served in church as with his family, God. We just lift them up, all the family and friends that are going to, uh, to mourn in the coming days, weeks, and months for his loss of remembering him and wanting to talk to him, but realizing we can't do it any longer. Uh, we just ask that you comfort them and be with them. Give them a level of peace. We thank you, Lord, uh, for our members who have been sick, who are still able to participate in worship, even though we're online. We ask for your healing hands to extend out to them, God, that they receive some comfort. We, we understand that you have a plan on how things are supposed to be done. And while our hearts may want their bodies to be healed, you have a plan that we just don't understand on what things should happen. So we ask God, even if things don't go the way we want, that you give us a level of peace and grace that we can endure whatever it is. I ask you for a special blessing to touch my Aunt Shirley right now as she's at home, uh, that she continue on her journey and comfort God, that we, I ask that I want to see a healing. I, I want to see restoration in this land, but God, I understand how it is that how we have to live, that you have certain things that have to uh, come to pass, but God, we just ask you continue to touch, that you continue to be with, that you continue to give peace and grace and mercy to those who are dealing with illnesses and battling through. And you have said in your word that our battle is not for us, it is yours to fight. And the battles are not always won against the enemy. We can see sometimes the battle comes against those who attack us from the inside, God. And because the battle is not ours to fight, we turn it over to you and shout hallelujah to your name. We cry glory because you are the great I am. And God, we move forward to those who are dealing with COVID and all manner of disease, that you continue to be with them, that you continue to show them, that you continue to show us those who are left behind to care for those, those who are left behind that are left to love these people, that we will continue to love them, show them what it means uh, to have un unrelenting love and a passion that will take care and endure all these things, God. We ask that you be with us as a nation as we continue to see the very fabric of which this nation was found and being ripped to shreds. We are seeing death on every land, people going into places and killing other people because they are dealing with issues that they have never dealt with, God. We are looking for this peace to come. We are looking for the people who are not trying to turn things into political things in which lives are at stake. We ask that you just be here with us and turn us into people who are called by your name, God. Not just because we say we are Christians, but because we demonstrate that we are Christians. That we ask that you be with us and let our lives be those that bring glory to you, God. Let the people can see us and see you in the reflection of everything that is happening in our lives. And so as we move forward with the rest of this service, I ask that you touch each and every person under the sound of my voice, that they receive your power, they receive your healing, they receive your restoration, that their lives would be changed, that they have a change of heart. And God, I ask that, that no, no blowback would come to me from the enemy for, for speaking your word, that, that you will keep your 
band of angels around me, keep me protected, uh, keep me hidden behind the cross, covered in your blood, that you will be lifted up and glorified and that I will be reduced, nothing more than just your servant, crying out in the wilderness, crying for people to baptize and change their ways. But you, God, get all the glory, for you are the great I am. You are the Almighty, and we love you, and we bless you, for it is in Jesus Christ's name that we do pray and believe, and everyone who is in agreement, wherever you are, say amen. Amen. Good morning. You know, that's funny because the first time I've heard my wife in the other room say amen or hallelujah. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> and I also hear her saying, mm. <laughs> but I hope that uh, all of you guys were uh, received that prayer and not only received it, uh, uh, will act on, on it accordingly. My eye was bothering me. So good morning again, Road to Damascus. It is so good to be here. You know what? For some, my allergies are starting to bother me also. I have to blow my nose. I'm going to turn my mic off for a second. So I hope you don't hear me. <laughs> okay, I should be good. <laughs> I should be good. I took my medicine last night. Uh, I've been taking it consistently, but this morning, for whatever reason, is really bothering me. But you know what? Even with my allergies bothering me, with, that, with it, in spite of all the things that are going on, today is the day that the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. I hope you guys feel the same way, too, that you do rejoice and are glad in this new day, uh, that despite what you're feeling right now, that despite any pain, that you may have in your joints, your knees, your hips, your back, your hands, uh, whatever's going on in your body, but you woke up this morning glad that today is the day that the Lord has made and you will rejoice and be glad in it. In 2021, we said that we are going deeper. That means that everything we do is going to be with an extra incentive. It is going to be uh, 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 with a focus to, to intentionally go deeper, go deeper in our prayer, go deeper in our worship, go deeper in our study, go deeper in every aspect of our life to become better, deeper in our change of heart to be the people that God has called us to be. Uh, um, so this is this is our, our desire. And, and as I get into the word this morning, this is uh, we're continuing where we left off last week. Uh, at, or yeah, we la left off last week. Uh, just kind of remembering uh, that the, uh, the thing we call Easter or Resurrection Day had been a week past. And now we are two weeks past the resurrection or at least two weeks past the day in which we acknowledge and, and praise God and worship God for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I don't know if any of you had really given a lot of thought to where you were last week, a week that had passed since the resurrection. But I pray that in the two weeks subsequent of the resurrection, or two weeks subsequent of the time that we acknowledge and celebrate the resurrection, that you really thought about what I preached last week, that you thought about the life of the thief on the cross who stood there or who was hung there next to Jesus Christ uh, and, and, and uh, um, the words that he said, that he started out the day one way and it ended uh, a different way. It's just a matter of fact, it reminds me just what, how did it start and how it's going? It started with him mocking our Lord and Savior and it ended with him acknowledging the Godhood in him. It's saying, remember me in paradise. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, or remember me when you get to your throne and when Jesus says today that you will be with me in paradise. We're going to get to that scripture, but uh, I, I wanted to know have the, where there may not have been a change last week. Uh, has there been a change approaching going through this week? Have, have you really given some thought to what Jesus had done on the cross? Did you give some thought to what the, the thief said that a thief who had never been exposed to Jesus Christ, a thief who had never witnessed the miracles of Christ, but for some reason, while he was hung on the cross next to Jesus, that he saw something in Jesus in that those hours that changed his life. Not only did it change his life for the rest of the time that he was alive on the cross, it changed his eternity and gave him salvation. 
So we go to the word of God and we, we, we had the two sections that we read. If you remember correctly, it is Matthew 27 verses 38 through 44. Uh, Matthew 27 verses 38 through 44. And then we're going to head over to another section. <clears throat> it says, then two robbers who were crucified with him, one on the right and another on the left. And those who passed by blasphemed him, wagging their heads, saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Uh, you remember when Jesus uh, and went into the temple and cleansed the temple, uh, he said that if you destroy this temple in three days, that I will, uh, 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 you, if you destroy this temple in three days, I will rebuild it. And these people are going by mocking him. Uh, so if you are uh, the son, if you are the son of God, uh, go ahead and, and bring this back, you know, re rebuild the, the, the temple. It says uh, that they went by wagging their heads saying, you who destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself if you are the son of God, come down from the cross. And in verse 41, likewise, the chief priests, the chief priests, the church folk uh, were going by mocking him. Uh, he uh, what does it say? The chief priest also mocking with the scribes and the elders said he saved others. <laughs> he saved others himself. He cannot save. He, if he is the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross and we will believe in him. Isn't it something how church folk are? And it says it, the, the chief priest mocking him also with the scribes and the elders. This is just not the pastor of the church. Oh, I'm sorry. My wife said, uh, y'all can't see me. Uh, hold on. Or me. It's, uh, I'm showing it on my end. Let's, let's do this, y'all. Let's, uh, hold on, stand by. We gonna get this right. You know how the enemy tries to strike at the heart of what the people of God are doing, but we are going to continue to push through and God will receive the glory, amen? We will not be deterred. We will not uh, uh, fall astray. We will not move away from what God is doing, what God's word says to his people. Uh, we will continue to do what it is that we are called to do. We are going to continue to trust in God. Uh, let's see here. Everything should be good by now. Am I back on screen? Can anybody see me? All right, beautiful, beautiful. Okay, so there we go. We're good to go now. So uh, church folk, that's where I was. Uh, yeah, the, the leaders of the church and the church folk they are saying he saved himself, but he himself, he cannot save. If you think about this, the God of all creation being mocked by the church folk saying he can save others. Okay, I don't know why the scripture, oh, you know what? I know why the scripture is not showing. Let's do this. That should make it work. And we should be good to go. No scripture still. You see me, but no scripture. All right, well, you know what? Y'all have uh, got your Bibles. I don't know what's going on. Everything is plugged in where it's supposed to be plugged in. Oh, you know what? Let's do one more thing because I want you guys to be able to see the scripture. Sometimes when you turn this thing on and off, you got to start over. And uh, that should be it. It takes, it's a lag, it's 30 seconds, so. Well, 
All right. Well, if it ain't working, if it's not going to show, it's no problem. You see me, that's good enough. Y'all have the uh, the word of God. Uh, get your Bibles out. If you've been using your phone or following along with me, write down the scripture. But anyway, the scripture, let's get back to this. Uh, it says that he, uh, verse 42, was that he said he saved others. Himself he cannot say. If he is the king of Israel, let him uh, now come down from the cross and he will, and he and we will believe in him. This is the, they weren't going to believe in him before, but if he comes down off the cross and said, we'll believe in him. Uh, it says in verse 43, he trusted in God. Uh, he trusted in God. Let him deliver him now. And if, if he will have him, for he has said, I am the son of God. Verse 44, it says, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him and with the same thing. This is, this is what the word of God is saying. Matthew's depiction that even the robbers on the cross we're participating with what the church folk were doing. And that's something we got to consider as believers that are we doing the things that are attractive to, to the people who are not a, uh, in the world, world in Christ? Uh, see, we're the church folk were doing the same thing the thieves were doing. That, it, 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 let's not forget that. It says the thieves, even the robbers who were crucified with him, reviled him with the same thing. Now, if, if the world is going to imitate us, they should imitate us in a godly and righteous way, not when we're living according to the flesh. And, and that's something we need to consider as believers that as we move forward, are we living lives that people replicate or want to, to emulate? And is, it, is that life one of Christ or is that one that is just of the flesh? Uh, let's go to, to Luke chapter 23, verse 39 through uh, 43. Uh, this is Luke's depiction as time has gone on throughout the day. He says that one of the criminals who were hanged uh, blasphemed him saying, if you are Christ, save yourself and us. But the other answering rebuked him saying, do, not, do you not even fear God seeing you are under the same condemnation? And we indeed justly for what we receive uh, the due re the, and we indeed justly for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Uh, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. And so if you remember last week, we had for a theme, a change of heart. I'm just trying this one more time. I was doing some stuff behind the scenes to see if this would work now, uh, but it's a change of heart. I don't know if anybody can see the heart or if I'm just missing from the, uh, the picture, but that's okay. Uh, so last week we had started uh, with this and, uh, and I told you, told you guys that, you know, I, I'm only speaking uh, for me, that how I felt when I watched this and how I felt, I'm sorry, how I felt when I was reading the scripture and how I felt as it was progressing uh, this week and last week and now this week, the impact that the crucifixion has had on my life, uh, the fact that, that people tend to believe, I actually uh, got a couple of texts uh, last week before the sermon, you know, wanting to know why I was going to talk about the crucifixion when we had passed Easter. And I still then and believe now that we need to talk more about the resurrection, not just once a year, because if we understand the power of the resurrection, if we understand what Jesus accomplished through the resurrection, then maybe we would start behaving a little bit differently because see, we, we act all nice and goody two shoes. And when the time leading up to what we call Easter, you know, we participate in the, in the Lenten season, a man-made word, a man-made object or, 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 or a, a season, uh, but we participate in that. We begin to have a change of heart. We Some people go to make sure they go and get the little smuts on their forehead uh, just so they can show to the world, I believe in Jesus. I'm a Christian. See, this is the evidence of that. I actually have some ashes on my forehead. And instead of understanding 
the uh, what the world actually needs to see is not you praying loudly in the square, as Jesus said in the word, is not, not be covering yourself with sackcloth and ashes so that everybody can see how holy you are, but to see how your transformed life has been changed and how you interact with your brother and sister, to see how your transformed at life has made you kinder, that your transformed life has made you more loving, that your transformed life has made you forgiving, that your transformed life has made you generous instead of the selfish, narcissistic, uh, self-centered person that you have been that is quick to fly off the handle unforgiving of anybody who has done anything. And the only thing that you're relentless in doing is running to the world for every last thing that happens in your life. And see, we don't care. The people of God shouldn't care about ashes on Ash Wednesday, but nonetheless, we lead up to Easter and we, we get all pious and we participate in the Daniel fast and we're posting it all on Facebook about how we gave up this and we gave up that. And then up until Good Friday, then you let it all go and just start eating everything that you've been forgiven, saying that you were given up. And then uh, Easter Sunday, when you show up to church with your brand new clothes and the women with the big hats and carrying the big Bibles and everything is good, but come Monday, we back to normal. Hmm. Jesus accomplished something great on the, on the cross for us. He, he, he accomplished something that was wonderful for us. It, 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 it encapsulated all things at all time. It was literally is at this one moment on Calvary that everything in history and from time from the beginning to the end converged on that one spot for which Christ paid the price for sins for everybody. Y'all weren't even born yet. I wasn't born, but Christ paid for our sins in advance. He's paying for my grandson's sins in advance. As long as this world is going to continue, he has paid the price for the years to come. Everything converged on that one spot. And we know that God had this in mind because he said it in his word. He says it in this word in Ephesians 1, 4. I forgot you guys can't see it. I'm changing. He said in Ephesians 1, 1, 4, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love. But the key that you get out of this, he chose us in him before the foundation of the earth was laid. That means that you go all the way back to Genesis 1-1, that even before Genesis 1-1 was in place, before the foundation of the earth was formed, he chose us. And then see, this was, he chose us. He knew that we couldn't do anything on our own. He knew we weren't going to be able to get to this place on our own. He knew we weren't going to be able to pay our own debt because we're just too doggone foul. He knew this. And so it says that, it, uh, that, that he, he knew he chose us before the foundation of the world. It did Jeremiah prophet, he even told him, he said, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And he, this is all the stuff he said, I knew you, I knew who you were. I knew what you were going to be. I knew you with all your faults. I knew all the choices you were going to make. I know all about your bad decisions. I know about your temper. I know about the anger. I know who's going to push your buttons to send you to the wrong place. I know about the person that's going to come and tempt you and take you away from me. I know all these things because before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Now, I knew you were going to have to suffer with this illness. I knew that something was going to come and ravage your body. You didn't know what it was, but I knew it because before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I knew the course of your life was going to take. I knew every mistake that you were going to make, even though I set the path for you to go. I knew you were going to go the other way. I knew everything that you were going to do to tear yourself down, to make yourself unworthy. I knew you before I formed you in the womb. And because I knew you, I had to send my son. That, that on this day, on the day that we recognized two weeks ago, that he had to go up on the cross and pay this price. That blood had to be shed because you can't come into my presence in the state that you're in. You can't come into my presence bringing all this foulness of the world, this the bitterness 
that's in your heart, that, that, that foul smell. I, I need you to be covered in the blood. Blood is the price for you to come back to me. He knew this. This, this, this event should not have gone uh, lightly. It should not have gone by the way of just another day. We, we should be marinating still on the crucifixion, not only on the crucifixion, but the resurrection, but the fact of the matter, he who was without sin went to the cross for you and I. This is not just an Easter thing. This is an eternal eternity thing. But he, he knew us. And, and, and the, the fact we, we, we even seen even recently, we, we talked about last week that the crucifixion was designed to deter robbers and criminals. It was designed to deter insurrectionists. And not unlike what we saw January 6, 2021, insurrectionists in, in, in ancient Rome and in this time in which we see Jesus in Jerusalem, that if they had captured these people storming the Capitol, they'd have been hung on the cross. And, and their actions would have been those of the thief that mocked him. Yeah, because there were others who were at home watching. What, what is going on here? Uh, what are they doing? It, it's, isn't it how we are? We, 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 we saw the story at the FedEx and, and understanding what, what is going on in the world that these people are, have lost their minds, that, that they will go into a place of business and just want, start shooting at people. We, we saw that in the grocery store a couple of them was a month ago in Colorado, just walking into the store, randomly shooting people in the parking lot and in the store something is wrong here we have forgotten about the crucifixion we have forgotten about the power of the resurrection our hearts have not been changed they are just hardened stones forgotten the power of the resurrection we have forgotten what God has done and we don't lack the strength and the inner fortitude to stand up for Jesus Christ. I know I keep thinking of the song playing over and over in my head. Stand up if you're on the Lord's side. See, is it, we, we as Christians have been cowering and, and hiding in our corners. We, we show up in church sometimes and we'll show up in Bible studies sometimes and we will share that we, we're, we're watching a service right now. But for the most part, we don't say anything because it, it doesn't take really anything to go to church. It doesn't take anything to hit the share button on your social media. But what it takes when, when you are actually seeing real change, what it takes is some inner fortitude and some strength to be different than who you were. It takes some strength and fortitude to actually witness to people. It takes strength and fortitude to actually demonstrate the qualities that God requires of us. But if we're not willing to do that, we are never going to see the change. And the other thing with the crucifixion is that it was meant to humiliate the criminal. The person being crucified, they, weren't, they didn't care about the dignity of the crook. We don't care about the dignity of criminals. We, you, see the, you see it right now that people, when we saw they just killed that young man in Minnesota last week, Deontay Wilson, or Wright, Deontay Wright that there are people already attacking him on the internet. Uh, they're confusing everything that they have about it because they don't care about his life. Just the same that Trayvon Martin was minding his own business when he's walking from the store with some Skittles and some iced tea, uh, that, that, that George Zimmerman didn't care about his life and subsequent neither did the world because all they tried to do was to paint him as someone who was not worthy of life. They tried to paint De Breonna Taylor as someone who was not worthy of life because somewhere along the line, she made the mistake of falling in love with the criminal. And they chose to highlight that instead of dealing with her humility. They shot her in the middle of the night in her house, in her night clothes. They didn't care about her dignity. They didn't care about Trayvon Martin's uh, uh, a dignity when they took pictures of him laying dead on the grass. Criminals, we don't care about their dignity. And when the oppressor certainly does not care about the dignity, see the oppressor in Jesus' time was the Roman government and they strung him up to the cross after they had whipped and beaten his body and put a crown of thorns in his head. They stripped him of all his clothes because the word said they cast lots 
for his clothes, they had him up on the cross naked for the world to see. And if the impact of our Christ strung up in all his pain and his all himself exposed to the world because of the sins that we have committed by thought, word, and deed, because of our evil hearts and our evil actions that we continue to keep Christ nailed to that cross every time we do something wrong, every time we choose not to love, every time we choose not to forgive, every time we choose not to have mercy for somebody. Every time we choose to not choose faith, we are putting Jesus on the cross exposed to the world that his dignity <laughs> was not there. See, uh, we, the dignity, we, and, and we as Christians, we, we tend to jump into that as well. Start to begin that people, uh, that they, they deserve what they got because somewhere along the line, they made a bad decision. As he, when Mike Brown was was murdered in St. Louis, uh, people said, "Well, he look, he was a thug. He just stole some cigars from this store." Well, the last time I checked, stealing cigars didn't require the death penalty. But see, we we begin to look past their humanity. We we ignore their dignity because. Jesus didn't do anything wrong. He didn't break any laws. Well, technically he did break some laws. He, he healed people on the Sabbath. He, he associated with people who were less than. And, it, you know, so we got to get rid of them. We, we can't have that. We, we can't have people going around healing folks on the Sabbath. We can't have people going searching for sheep on the Sabbath. They're, they're not supposed to work on the Sabbath. They chose to ignore his humanity and his dignity. The, the crosses were for criminals. And I pointed out last week that while there's a school of thought that Barabbas and the thieves were maybe freedom fighters fighting for the Jewish people, I expressed my, my thought that they weren't such as that, that they were actually the criminals and robbers that they were called because God was putting Jesus on the cross with freedom fighters doesn't fit with the story of resurrection. See, the thief doesn't have to ask Jesus to, uh, uh, don't, doesn't have to say, I tell Jesus, don't forget me because he's doing what's right, fighting for freedom, fighting for people. The reason he had to ask Jesus to, for, to not forget him was because he was not living for Jesus. The reason why Barabbas was going to be crucified was not because he was fighting for the freedom of the people, it was because he had murdered folks. And what good is the story for God to uh, crucify Jesus for, uh, with good people who are fighting for his chosen folk? The power of the resurrection comes not only from him rising from the cross, but in Jesus' own state of agony and pain and humiliation that he still can forgive the thief and tell him on this day, you will be with me in paradise. That's where we see the power. The people who said that they, to let Jesus be crucified were the very people that Jesus has come to save. Uh, the, I told y'all last week, I don't want you to think that you're better than any of the, uh, the, the Christians or any of the Jews that were there because we continue to live our lives in a way that does not say that we want Christ to be Lord of our lives. It's our lives are walking descriptions of let him be crucified. That, that foul thought, the, the foul word, the, the unforgiveness, the, the hair trigger anger that become or rage that comes out uh, that that's let him be crucified the, the the unforgiveness and the unlovingness let him be crucified don't don't look back on them feeling like you're better and superior that you would have done something different because your life is a walking testament right now that you are doing the same uh, in our Bible reading. Remember when we did, when they were at the uh, the children of Israel in the wilderness, and, and Joshua set up the rock, said that the, these rocks have witnessed 
what you have done, the rocks will be a test to give testimony to what you, the kind of person you are. You see, everything that has life that God has created will be able to testify against us on the day of judgment. You think you good, you think you're all, all that, but the rock will testify because the rock was there when you were unloving, when you were unforgiving. The sin that you, that you live or that you did, that you participated in that said, let him be crucified. <laughs> we don't know a whole lot about the thieves. We don't know their names, but we do know he was there with the two of them at that point on Calvary. So the week had passed last week. Now we're in another week, two weeks. Have you reflected on the crucifixion? Has your life now become a reflection of the crucifixion or are you still doing the same old thing? Or it, has your heart changed at all? Mm. Mm. In Matthew 27, verse 44, we, the first scripture we read said, even the robbers who were crucified with him reviled him with the same thing. This is who Jesus was crucified with on top of having the church folk down below mocking him, wagging their heads at him, talking trash, throwing shade as they would say. But somewhere between the start of the crucifixion, one robber started out one way and ended a different. He said in Luke 23, 42, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He started out participating in the trash talk and ended up asking God to not forget him. Has your life had a change of heart? What have you learned in these two weeks? What has your life been in these two weeks? I'm going to read something I found on the internet. It said, is it not uncommon to hear people say, be saved as the thief was saved? The impression is left that being saved as the thief was a simple matter. All you have to do is believe and call on the Lord the way the, the, the thief did, and you will be saved. This is how what the, the writer is saying. This is what people think. Some who make the assertion have never thought about the difficulty faced by the thief. Had anybody ever considered what it took for that thief on the cross to then chastise the, his, his partner, his compadre, his homie? Did anybody ever think about what, how difficult that was? It, it, so J.W. McGarvey, I got the name for this one. He says, the example of the penitent robber is a difficult one to follow. He professed faith in Christ and his kingdom when there was no other voice in the whole world willing to do such a thing. Remember that when Jesus was on the cross, his people were, they had scattered. They're running and hide. The only people who were near the cross was Mary and the, John. They, they said the, the one that Jesus loved was at the foot, but everybody else was gone. Peter, who was always shooting off his mouth, telling Jesus that he would never leave him, was the one gone away. Remember, Jesus had to tell him, before the cock crows three times, you will deny me. Peter said, no, I won't. But it turned out he did. They're all over there. And so here's the cross, at the scene of the cross. And the, the crook is there. And it said, uh, uh, he professed faith in Christ and his kingdom when there was no other voice in the whole world willing to do such a thing. Not a whole world. Peter, when he was associated with Jesus, he said, I don't know this man. People who say, I don't know Christ, people who deny Christ are not speaking for his kingdom. But let me tell you something here, lest you believe that you're better than other people, that you may not physically open your mouth and deny Christ, but your life, again, is a walking testament that you do not believe in Christ. When people look at you and all they see is your anger, your unkindness, your unlovingness, your willing, uh, unwillingness to forgive folk, what they see is not a Christian, or actually they see someone who is labeled as a Christian, 
but what they see is someone who is not speaking, whose life does not reflect that Jesus is their Lord and Savior. You are, this is a person who is not professing the kingdom of Christ. And, and I, and I, believe me, I know it's hard to, to accept. I, I know it is. It, look, you've been doing this Christian thing a long time. You've been praying a long time. You probably got your Bible that's so old and tattered that your grandmother gave. You got tape and pages missing in the whole bit. I get that. But you don't have to prove nothing to me. I'm not the judge. I'm not going to be sitting up there with Jesus and talk about, uh, look, Jay, uh, I was there with him. And I saw what he did because, because I'm going to tell you this, if, it, if, if Christ calls me as a witness, I'm going to be a canary. I'm going to be singing like a bird. That's him. That's him. That's her. I was right there with him. A plea bargain, if you will, to get me out of hell that I could go to heaven. But what I'm saying is that y'all think you're so good. But I'm telling you what it took for the thief was a lot more than other, most of us are willing to do. Uh, see, he professed faith in Christ and his kingdom when there was no other voice in the whole world willing to do such a thing. Picture the scene near the cross where Jesus' enemies, sarcastic and abusive, at the edge of the mob were Jesus' friends, brokenhearted and silent, at the edge of the scene where everything's happening as everybody's talking and, and, and mocking and being sarcastic and attacking Jesus, but on the edge, on the outskirts, Away from the action where all his people, faithless, courageless, just afraid, brokenhearted, and more importantly, silent. Their hopes for a physical, political kingdom had been dashed. Their preconceptions had no place for a crucified king. In that crowd, a single expression of faith was heard. And who did that single expression of faith came, come from? a nameless thief. Out of all these people who were just shouting the week before, Hosanna, the king, uh, the, 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 here comes the king, but Jesus of Nazareth, uh, the, the people who he helped, the, the people he had restored sight to and, and restored the ability to walk, those he had laid hands on and prayed for, those he had fed the 5,000 with the fish and the, and the bread, and here they are. Not one speaking up on his behalf. The only voice crying out for Jesus speaking on his behalf is the nameless thief who was doomed to the same fate as Jesus. So let me give you three points and we go get out of here. This is what the thief demonstrates and what we need to demonstrate if we wanna have a change of heart. The first thing we see from the thief is that he displayed courage. As he, verse 40, he says, but the other answer and rebuked him and saying, this is in the Luke uh, scripture, uh, believe, do you not even fear God seeing that you are under the same condemnation? As he, in the beginning of the day, he's mocking Jesus, but when he there is next to him and he's realizing the things that have gone on and he is seeing how his life has amounted to nothing and brought him to a place where he is going to face certain death. He alone stood up and chastised the other thief. Do you not even fear God? See, the courage he displayed, he was still there. Somebody would say, well, he was already going to die. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Bro was going to die. But his death could have been much worse, see, because the soldiers were still there. They had a club where they could have broke his kneecaps. They had the spear. They could have jabbed it into his side like they did to Jesus. There's a whole lot of stuff that could have gone on to make the rest of his time on this planet miserable. But even in spite of that, even in spite of the fact that he knew he was facing certain death, he decided to speak up a life that had not shown any any remorse or any change, a life that was not even showing anything that he knew of God. Here he was, the lone voice who never knew him, never walked with him, never received a healing from him, never heard anybody pray for him, but yet he is the one that displays the courage and says, do you not fear God? Ha! Where are the Christian folk going to be that are going to go to the world and say, do you not fear God? Ah! How do we as a society, 
<laughs> elect a man who does not know God and sit and continue to sit in churches with folks that defend him saying he was chosen by God, where are the Christian folk to stand up and say, do you not fear God? Where is your courage? <laughs> Where y'all at? Where you at? That's what I'm asking you today. Where you at? Ah, uh, in Isaiah 51:10. See, the thief didn't know Jesus. But Isaiah wrote in 51:10, he said, he's remembering, uh, telling us what God is speaking to the people. And somewhere on that cross, the thief got this message. And God Jesus reached him and says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. Uh, because remember, the thief, before he died, he started out mocking Jesus, but he said, Lord, acknowledging who Jesus was, remember me when you get to your kingdom. There's everything had changed now. Everything changed for him that did not, my life may have been worthless. My life may have amounted to nothing. Everything that I've done was against the will of God, but God, I am asking you today to remember me. Lord, remember me. But before I even say, Lord, remember me, what I'm going to do is speak up on behalf of the God that I believe in, the God that I serve. And have you no fear of God? Don't sit here telling me that you love Jesus when you out here fornicated. Don't tell me you out here love Jesus and you love God when you can't even forgive somebody. Don't tell me that you love Jesus when you are around here, the angriest person walking on the face of this earth. Don't sit here and try to tell me or convince me how much you love God when you got no faith. The thief had courage when he should not have any. He's on the cross next to Jesus Christ. And he spoke up because he knew somewhere Isaiah's words got to him, fear not. And that's Jesus' word to us, fear not, have courage. You see that so many times in the Bible. Do not be dismayed, do not be discouraged, but have heart, have courage. I will be with you. That's, that's number one. Number two, you want to have a change of heart. You got to be like the thief and have contrition. Contrition is just another word for repent. Repent for who you are. He said in verse 41, after he, have you no fear of God? Have, do you not fear God? And in verse 41, he says, we indeed, we, we, and we indeed justly, for we have received the due reward of our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. He had realized that he had done everything wrong, but Jesus had done everything right. We deserve the punishment that we're supposed to get. We deserve to be put to death. We're, we are right in the place where we're supposed to be. He is coming with a contrite heart. This is what they say. He has a contrite heart. He had contrition on full display, even where he was, even knowing that he can be punished even further, even though he knew he could experience further pain on the cross. He comes to Jesus, he, he chastises, he, he displays the courage and tells his boy, you know, shut up, man. You don't have no fear of God. And we are here because we deserve it. We have lived lives that display our, our, our indiscretion towards God. We don't, don't care about him. We don't care about living right. But he's done nothing wrong. Let's see. You got to be have some uh, contrition. You got to be able to come to God and say, I am a sinner in need of prayer. Uh, I have sinned, God, and I need to change from my ways. God, I am not someone who forgives folks. I need you to give me a forgiving heart. David wrote in Psalm 5110, I don't know how many times I got to keep telling you this, but this should be your prayer. Create in me a clean heart, oh God, and renew a right spirit in me. David, uh, the reason why David was a man after God's own heart is because he was contrite. And when he did wrong, not that he was perfect, but when he had done wrong, that he was willing to come to God and say, I'm sorry, God, for what I have done. He was willing to be contrite and come to God and say that I am a sinner, that I will worship you as hard as I can to, to make amends for the things that I've done. The thief came with a contrite heart. He had courage. 
he displayed contrition. And the last thing, uh, uh, oh, wait a minute, oh, I'm sorry, I'm about to lose, lose track. Let's, see, let's look at the thief compared to the disciples. Yeah, see, uh, 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 in, in Matthew 10, 37, uh, the disciples are, are debating about, you know, going to heaven. And in 37, they said, uh, this is, these are the disciples, the, the people who love God the most, the, the ones who uh, love God the most, I'm doing the air quotes, the ones who walk with him, uh, they said uh, to him, grant us that we may sit one on your right and the other on your left in your glory. <laughs> this is what uh, the disciples are asking this is you and, and, and y'all know that's that's the kind of spirit we possess as believers right if that I, I've served you God I, I've gone to church God I've I've contributed to, uh, to your church God I hey I did the above and beyond I've been giving my 21 dollars to, to road to Damascus church I contributed to the scholarship fund I've done all these things where can I sit when I get to heaven God can I sit at your right hand We always expect and we treat God like a genie in a bottle. I'm going to rub the bottle and God's going to give me everything that I want. And the sad part is y'all got preachers that you listen to tell you the same thing. The reason why you don't have this is because you haven't been rubbing the genie on the bottle. God is going to pour out all his blessings and we forget that all his blessings are not monetary. Sometimes his blessing amounts to peace. And let me tell you what, if you don't have peace, no amount of money is going to give you peace. Remember, if you've read, been reading in your Bibles, uh, Saul, was when he was tormented from the spirit, he didn't have peace. Some of us are dealing with some major things going on in our lives. We got some major financial issues. We got some major health issues. We got some things happening in our families. We got people who are dying. We're calling our family around the country, making sure they weren't in that store or in that area when this crazy gunman went off. We're hearing about stories of people making sure it's not one of our family members that got pulled over by police and shot unjustly. And you can't sleep at night. You got no peace. Who cares if you have $100 million if you got no peace? Oh, yeah, rub. make sure you rub that bottle and have your faith and ask God for all that you want. Boy, I tell you what, when you have experienced some peace, I guarantee you there's some people sleeping under a freeway overpass that have more peace than those living in a Beverly Hills mansion. They don't know where their next meal is coming from tomorrow, but they got more peace than them. They're asking can we sit at the right hand and the other on your left in your glory? But what did the thief say? Lord, he just, don't forget me. Contrition. Lord, don't forget me. Remember that, that old song, Lord, uh, Savior. I'm calling Savior, Savior. Do not pass me by. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Remember this song, hear my humble cry. This is the thief. If you don't understand what it means to be humble, put yourself in the position of the thief. Hear my humble cry. While on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Lord, I wish we were actually in church because I'd have Stephen start playing that song and I would sing it. Oh, man. Contrition. He had a contrite heart. All he wanted, the disciples want stuff. They want glory. They wanted power. The thief just wanted to not be forgotten. So two points, courage. He had courage. He had contrition. And the last thing that you need to have, like the thief, is conversion. That you, you'll say, oh, oh, but Pastor Ron, I converted a long time ago. I, I gave my life to Christ. See, here, just, just stop it. Stop right where you are. You may have, we have done this. We play this game with church. Remember I told you about the dude who I went to church with Every year, like clockwork, you could set your watch to it. He'd come to church and give his life to Christ. He'd rededicate his life to Christ. 
The next year, here he was back at the church, rededicating his life to Christ. Year go by, he, we ain't seen him back in church until a year comes by. I'm telling you, you can set your watch to it that he go come back to church and rededicate his life to Christ. I've even told y'all that even in ministry, I'm serving in ministry, that I actually had a moment. I had given my life to Christ when I was 13. And I gave my life to Christ again when I was about 24. And I gave my life to Christ again around 33, 33, 34. And even in ministry, I had to stop and tell God, I'm stop playing games with you, Lord, and I'm going to serve you for the rest of my life. I was in my 40s, my late 40s, when I actually gave my life to Christ. So we could sit around here and talk about what we've done and what we do and how we gave our lives to Christ. But the true conversion is when you actually start displaying the tendency or the characteristics of Christ, not just in name only, but in action, that your life is a reflection, that you do believe in what you say, that you are a loving person, that you are a forgiving person, that you give mercy to those who have offended you, that you forgive folk, that you are not walking around with your butt on your shoulders shoulders all the time because you mad at somebody and you're going to call yourself a Christian. The thief had true conversion, courage, contrition, and conversion. Verse 42, he said, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. <laughs> uh, see, it is, listen to the words. He didn't say, uh, savior. He said, Lord, you see, there's a difference there. A lot of folk, everybody want a savior, but not everybody want a Lord. I can't remember where I heard that, but see, see, any the savior just means you want somebody to save your butt. You want Jesus to go up on the cross and do what he does. You want him to go down into the pits of hell and you want him to rise with all power on the third day so that you can benefit from all the stuff that God has, is, is promising us, but we don't want a Lord. Because the Lord means there's somebody over us. And when somebody is over us, I don't do well taking orders from folk. Y'all know if you've ever been in any position of leadership in a job, or even you just got some family members that can't hold on to a job, they'll be telling you all the time, well, my boss did this and my boss did that. And they go from job to job to job to job to job. And it's always the boss. They ain't never looking in the mirror and realizing that they are the, really the ones with the problem. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. A Lord over us means that we got to live when Jesus is Lord of your life. That means that you are going to live according to his way and his rules. That means that we are going to love folk. That means we're going to be generous. That means that when God says that you to, to give, we're going to give. When God says you're going to forgive, you're going to forgive. When God says that you're supposed to turn another cheek, you're going to turn another cheek. Well, no, 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 no. I ain't, I ain't playing that, Ron. I, I, I'm, I'm a man. I, I ain't nobody doing that. Hey, do you play it? I, <laughs> it's all up to you. Now, you keep it wrong. I, I ain't, you know, I'm sitting around there. Whatever words I always say, we, we love to say, I ain't no punk. I'm just telling you what the word says. And when you want to be like Jesus, then you got to start acting like Jesus. And when you start acting like Jesus, then you're going to be more loving. You're going to be more forgiving. You're going to be more caring. You're going to be more generous. You're going to, not only that, you'll have the power to be praying for folks and laying on hands and watching miracle signs and wonders occur because he showed it with his disciples. True conversion. Jesus was his Lord. He said it. He acknowledged not just the fact that Jesus was an innocent man. He acknowledged the fact that Jesus was the son of God and had power. Lord, see, and, and here's, here, let me just, this just popped into my head. This shows what he believed in Christ in that short amount of time. Not only was he accepting Jesus as his Lord, and not only was he asking God not to forget him, but he has really have gotten to the place of conversion that Jesus is the son of God and knowing that he is coming back because he said, remember me when you get into your kingdom, which means that there was something on the other side that he didn't know about, but now he sees. Remember me when you get into your kingdom. Lord, 
remember me. Not, not just Jesus remember me, not just Savior remember me, Lord. And Lord means I am submitting to your will. I am submitting to your way. He had conversion, conversion. And we, we, we see uh, the Old Testament tells us in 2 Chronicles 30, verse 9, it is 2 Chronicles chapter 30, verse 9. This is coming from way back. And this is a reminder for us about why we need conversion. For if you return to the Lord, your brethren and your children will be treated with compassion by those who lead them captive so that you, but that they may come back to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and merciful and will not turn his face from you if you return to him. He's asking for conversion. You convert from your evil ways and convert from the life that you have been living and come back to me, I won't turn my face from you. He's given us this promise that the thief has shown that if you believe and trust in God, that God is able to forgive us for all that we have done and all that we will do. But we have to have courage. You have to have contri contrition and you gotta have conversion. And when we do these three things, we'll have a change of heart. A heart that is no longer with stone, but one that is made of flesh and spirit, the spirit of God. That, Psalm 51.10, create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. This is what we need to have, a change of heart. And the thief on the cross is proof that it's never too late, that you might have felt you have wasted your life, that you have done so many things wrong and that you are beyond the reach of God but he is proof that no one or nothing is beyond the reach of God. No time is beyond God's uh, timing. That here he is, it led a life of crime and a life that led to nothing, led him to death. And some folk, see, when Paul wrote that all things work together for good, for those who love the Lord, those called according to his purpose, here is a man that his life that amounted to nothing and everything he did was wrong and hurt other people, but it put him in position to be next to Jesus. It ain't ever too late. Ha! Let that sink in, that everything he did was wrong, but it led him to the place where he was next to our Lord and Savior. Everything in your life, everything, whether it was good or you see it as bad, whether you experience in pain or joy, whether you have had sorrow or health concerns or monetary concerns, everything is leading you to that place right next to Jesus. The outcome will be different for all of us. Some of us will be next to Jesus because we'll be courageous, we'll have a contrite heart, and we will have converted and accepted Jesus as our Lord. And some of us, even when we're next to Jesus, will be just like that other way, still mocking him till the end. Oh, glory to God, glory to God. Our Lord, we just come to you thanking you and praising you. We give you praise for the thief that was on the cross that gave us a lesson that we should learn. That we, we, we ask God that you touch our hearts, that we will be courageous Christians. We will, will not cower in the face of, of, of the enemy, that when the time comes, that we will stand tall, that we will speak who you are. We won't hide on the outskirts of all the action. We will stand up in the middle and speak out against those who, who, who tried to pull you down and try to defame your name, those who claim to be of yours that are not of your, your family, Lord. We're going to be courageous. 
and our hearts will be changed. We'll be, we, we're asked that you could give us a contrite heart that we experience what it is to, to stop living for ourselves and begin to live for you. That we will acknowledge that we are sinners in need of a savior. That we will ask for forgiveness and be free to give forgiveness to others as you have given it to us. That we will love those who are unlovable because God, we know that we're unlovable. That we will show mercy to those who are in need of mercy. We will be generous for those because God, the purpose of us is to be to dis display your kindness. You, you told us in your word that it is important for us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. But on top of that, we have to love our neighbor as ourselves. So God, give us a heart that will be contrite and obedient. And lastly, God, give us conversion true conversion not one in name where we continually say we're turning over our life to you but when we actually submit and bow down fall prostrate on the floor and honor and praise you as our lord and as our god we don't want to need anything else as long as we have you god we have everything that we need we believe and trust in you and we ask for all these things courage contrition, and conversion. In your son, Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen, y'all. Amen. You know, I, I'm, I'm always amazed sometimes when I look at my life and the things that I've done and that God would still <laughs> see me as worthy. That, that even as a minister that I had to come to God after preaching his gospel to be converted, to show some courage and to have a contrition and to truly convert my life to be a servant of the most high. But those are there people out there wondering why? Because God had said in Romans 10 and nine that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and if you believe in his heart, in your heart that God did raise him from the dead that you will be saved. He is offering that to all of us, conversion to confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe that God did raise him from the dead. So this is what I'm, I'm offering to you that you, uh, sir, who was out there that doesn't know Christ and the pardon of your sins, you ma'am who is wondering what this all means, or do you just confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And after you have made that initial connection, uh, confession, then we extend a membership into some church Obviously, we would like you to come to Road to Damascus Church. We believe we are a church that loves each other. When you are getting the word of God, not my opinion, not something that can, uh, flies in the face of scripture, but true Bible believing. But we offer it here at Road to Damascus Church, and we will be resuming in-person worship soon. And you can come to our church, and if you can't, you can still watch us online. But we offer that opportunity for you to come and know more about Christ before it's too late. Don't wait till you're on the cross next to Jesus. You just wanna be in his presence so you can say to Jesus, Lord, remember me. Don't forget me. Don't pass me by, Savior. Remember me. And that's what we offer at Road to Damascus Church. If you have questions, shoot us an email at info at r2dchurch.org. Uh, or put it in the chat on YouTube or Facebook. If you have questions, we'll reach out to you and, and we will pray for you if indeed you need prayer. But that's, that's uh, I think that's all I got for, uh, for this day. Remember, we got some more. We still got all these birthdays in April. Uh, the Jackson's family, uh, the Dre had his birthday. I think we got next uh, uh, brother Jesse and Janae. Uh, birthdays, you know, we had, yesterday was my brother's birthday and my uh, sister-in-law, Ashley's birthday, a uh, bunch of birthdays. Uh, Elder's birthday was last week, Elder Marshall. Uh, so we still got more birthdays. Continue in your Bible reading, your daily Bible reading. Continue to pray for the family of Willie Nelson that they will find some peace during this time. I went a little long today, but I wanted to get it done. So we're done with this uh, change of heart. But even though we're done with this sermon, don't forget about the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of our Lord and Savior. It is not a once a year thing. It is a daily, daily, daily way of life to remember that. 
So the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. As we leave this place, but never far from his presence, I pray that the Lord bless you, that he keep you, that he protect you, that he changes your heart, that you might show courage, contrition, and conversion until we meet again, that he keep you covered and protected under the uh, shadow of his wings. I say goodbye, be blessed in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Y'all have a good rest of the day and a great week. And always remember, Pastor Ron loves you and ain't nothing you can do about it. You guys have a great week.